Well, hello there. My name is Matthew Thrift, and I am the broker in charge of the Simpsonville and Greer offices of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Seed and Joiner Realtors here in Greenville, South Carolina. And this video will discuss and hopefully teach the SCR Form 220, also known as the Exclusive right to sell listing agreement as you know um, just this past january january 1st 2020 the south carolina association of realtors um, changed some things in our listing agreement we've we've brought it more up to date we've added a few things that we needed to add and um, i'm wanting this to go out to as many people as possible so you can uh, get the latest information on the latest contracts that are available to you as a South Carolina realtor. Now, as always in my videos, I always start out by saying I am not an attorney. I am a human being. I am errant. Therefore, I can make a mistake. And since I may or may not be your broker, and especially if I'm not your broker, um, my disclaimer is always, always, always check with your broker to make sure they want you to do something that I've explained. And if they don't, please go by your broker's recommendations, not mine. Remember, this is being put out for agents of the Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Seed and Joiner Realtors, agents, not only just for Simpsonville and Greer, but for other agents throughout the company. But if you do not work for our company, please, again, I, I implore you, check with your broker. And if you feel that I've said something wrong, um, please kindly let me know and I can get it corrected but also check with your broker okay so i think i've i think i've nailed that disclaimer into the ground anyway let's uh let's start out by talking about the first section on page one so the first section doesn't really have a number it's just basically the the basic information who are the sellers who is the listing brokerage you see it there in that blank line you put your seller one your seller to how many sellers that you have obviously if you need more room you can use an addendum for that for if you have multiple sellers um, also in our company uh, it's okay since this is not a uh, a marketable document we can use the acronym BHHS seat and joiner realtors you do not need to have your office for example Simpsonville or Greer it's just seat and joiner realtors since we're all one large company um, it's going to continue on in that second paragraph there for the beginning uh, start date. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. And at the next blank line there, the ending date, that's pretty self-explanatory. You need to have a start and end date for your listing agreements. If you don't, it's considered not a uh, it's considered a voidable listing agreement. Everything ha uh, contracts have to have a start and end date. Fill out your lot block section and subdivision especially your subdivision and on um, uh, going down below that's pretty easy fill out your address and in, in its entirety um, definitely don't miss your tax amount number if you are listing more than one property for these same sellers let's say the tax amount numbers are attached um, my preference is that you have a separate listing agreement for that particular tax amount number remember in MLS you can only list one tax amount number so I would prefer to have a totally separate listing agreement if you're listing more than one tax map number. And in the MLS, just refer back to each tax map number within your member remarks. The next section there uh, talks about any other property that's going to be sold. Now remember, we don't sell real property, um, but our lenders do allow us to have a refrigerator, washer, and dryer. Now, uh, for the most part, the, the, most loans allow refrigerator, washer, and dryer to be actually in the real estate contract. So if your sellers want you to um, just list that as part, part of the house sale, you can go ahead and put that there if, if you prefer. Um, or anything else that's, that's necessary right there, you can do so. Now, let's go on to actually section one. 
Section one is the consent to disclose dual and designated agency. And that first line, uh, when in when a seller or seller's initial there, they're stating that you as the listing agent have provided them the meaningful explanation of, dis of brokerage relationships or agency the South from the South Carolina Disclosure of Brokerage Relationships document uh, promulgated by the LLR, uh, that you've provided a meaningful explanation of that and you've also provided them a copy of that. So they understand the differences between single, dual, and designated agency. Now, the second and third line there uh, allows a seller to decide whether or not they're going to uh, uh, agree or not agree to dual agency. Some sellers only want you as the listing agent to represent them. They do not want you representing a buyer. You need to have that conversation up front. The same thing goes for lines three or four. That is designed for designated agency, which we all know if you as a listing agent list a property and another agent within your office brings a buyer, um, the seller will be provided a time to say yes or no to designated agency. Now they can do that right up front here they can automatically say no right up front. Most of the time we see sellers saying, yes, it's okay for designated agency. But remember, in each of these, the dual or designated, if they're saying they will agree to it or think about it at the time uh, on lines three or five there, remember if either one of those things happen, you must have a separate dual or designated agency document signed by all parties. So just keep that in mind if that does happen. There's not a whole lot in that section. Let's go into section two. Section two is the terms of the agreement. And, and basically, there's not a whole lot to this, but basically it's the listing price, what the seller is going to pay the listing brokerage or your listing fee. Um, and on the screen there, I don't, if it says six or seven or five or whatever the case may be. Remember, I'm not gonna talk about commissions here. Um, whatever your brokerage charges to list a property or whatever you charge specifically to list a property, that's where you would go. Uh, if you see a number there, that's strictly for a demonstrational purposes only. That is not a suggestion, just so you know. Um, so it's basically the listing price of the property. What is the property gonna be listed at in the MLS or wherever it's marketed? And then your commission your listing fee that the seller is going to pay the listing brokerage and then it has another line there for a dollar amount if you're going to charge a flat fee now there are some people some agents out there that charge flat fees instead of a percentage that's okay too there's nothing wrong with that check with your office policy and with your broker however they want you to handle that the next lines there are also discussing uh, a dollar amount or percentage amount that you are going to, that the listing brokerage is going to pay the cooperating broker. Again, if there's a number there, it's strictly for demonstrational purposes. It could be two, it could be two and a half, it could be three, it could be four, it could be five, it could be 10. Whatever the case may be, that is your cooperating brokerage fee that is going to go within the MLS that is going to be the payment that is going to come out of the listing commission or listing fee to be paid to the cooperating broker. That's all that that is discussing there. Um, it also says in that second paragraph that we're going to defer the commission that's earned once a ready, willing, and able buyer uh, presents an offer and the property goes under contract that theoretically the commission is earned when that happens. But this contract states that we're going to defer that commission until the closing date or the default by the owner. If the seller pulls out of the contract, theoretically, this contract gives us or the listing brokerage the opportunity to secure the commission that was earned by bringing a ready, willing, and able buyer. Basically, it's deterring sellers from just having a property marketed, getting a property under contract, and then deciding later not to sell. That's kind of a, hey, don't do this because we're entitled to our commission because we earned it when we brought your ready, willing, and able buyer. If the property is sold within blank number of days of the expiration or termination of this agreement, it's the protection period of us, uh, for us, I should say. Um, but that last line is the kicker. It says the protection period shall be terminated if owners 
or owner enters into a listing agreement with another brokerage during the protection period. And that's a lot of times what happens when a listing agreement or a listing goes expired or withdrawn, a lot of times a seller will then enter into another agreement with another listing brokerage. Therefore, this protection period does in fact go away. Now, when this would come into play is if a seller decided to list a property and then the agent would market the property and after a period of time then there's been showings um, and the agent is doing their job, the listing brokerage is doing their job to market the property. Uh, seller decides to go behind the listing brokerage's back and uh, stop the contract so that the seller can get together with whoever's come to them and they're going behind the brokerage's back to sell the property without having to go through the listing brokerage. That's what this is designed to do. It's also designed to deter that for sellers to do that. We don't really see a whole lot of that happening because of the language uh, in this con contract. So that's a good thing, but just understand just because your listing expires or withdrawn, if the property is listed with another brokerage, your protection period goes away. Don't forget to have all owners uh, initial on the bottom as well as the listing agent. It says broker have read this page on the bottom. Um, that is not necessarily the broker in charge. Remember the broker in charge duties are passed to you under your, underneath that the broker's license. So you can go ahead, I prefer you go ahead and initial this document because this is a document that is a contract between the seller and the listing brokerage. So you go ahead and initial there, have all your uh, uh, sellers initial there as well. Continuing on in section 2B, for the purposes of this agreement, a sale shall be defined as any transfer of a legal, equitable, or beneficial interest in the subject property, whether for money or in exchange of another property, and shall include but not be limited to any transfer of the ownership interest in any cooperation, limited partnership, partnership, or other entity. They're just defining what a, uh, a transfer is and what the purpose of this document is. Other than that, let's go on to uh, section 3, compensation to other brokerages. Section three discusses the compensation to other brokerages. And I'm not gonna read it all. Basically, in our brokerage in Berkshire Hathaway City and Joyner Realtors, um, we, our policy allows us to pay buyer's agents and it allows us to pay transaction uh, brokerages. So we're not going to pay sub-agency, it's against our policy. Uh, if you're watching this video and you do not work for Berkshire Hathaway, please check with your broker. Please check your policy manual. Uh, your, your policies may be different than ours. But in this company, our policy is that we pay listing agents, pay buyer's agents to bring buyers. And we also pay those uh, agents that only have a customer in the transaction. Therefore, they're not being fully represented under single agency. They're being brought to the transaction by the agent as a customer in South Carolina. Therefore, we are going to pay them a transaction brokerage fee to bring them to buy our property. This is just good practice as far as what our company uh, has decided and is concerned. We want to give our sellers the, the, the most people looking at their property and that's one of the reasons why we pay uh, transaction brokerage as well as buyer's agents. So therefore, it's pretty simple. Uh, you either put a percentage there or you put the flat fee and that's gonna also go in your multiple listing service listing. So therefore, these two need to match up and BA in your MLS or it could be something else, it's BA in the Greenville MLS should match that number. And then TB should match the transaction brokerage number that you have there. Other than that, that's all there is in section three. Let's go on to section four. Section four talks about earnest money. And basically this entire section is the seller providing authority for an escrow agent or escrow holder such as the brokerage or the closing attorney or an escrow holder of some sort that all earnest money will be deposited within an escrow agent's account for the purposes of that money being credited to the seller at closing. The seller is providing authority. But what I really want to, to, to go over is just underneath that section where it says, Owner understands that under all circumstances, including default, broker will not 
disperse earnest money to either party until both parties have executed an agreement authorizing the disbursement or until a court of competent jurisdiction has directed a disbursement. Please get that a point to your sellers. Um, if, if there's a default by the buyer during the contract for sale, uh, just because the seller may think that they're owed earnest money for a default or some other reason, unless there's a meeting of the minds and both parties agree for their, that disbursement, money will sit in, in an escrow agent's account, especially a brokerages, a real estate brokerages account. Now, if an attorney's holding it, an attorney's office, an attorney escrow agent is not held under the same standards as a real estate brokerage uh, trust account. And the attorney may have their own disbursement, escrow disbursement agreement based upon the circumstances. And so we're seeing a lot more of that in 2020. So just make sure that when earnest money is, is held by an attorney, that an escrow disbursement agreement, hopefully they have one, and that the seller gets a copy of that so they know exactly what's gonna happen, uh, especially when the property goes under contract, if there was some sort of default with their earnest money. If it's held by a brokerage, which our brokerage, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, CD and Joiner Realtors, has gotten to a point where we're no longer holding escrow money. We will in absolute extreme circumstances, but we are directing all earnest money to be held by our attorney of choice or by the closing attorney. So just make sure that you let them know if we did hold earnest money and there was a dispute, our company would not release earnest money unless both the buyer and seller sign an agreement or a court of competent jurisdiction tells us how to disperse this agreement and maybe an interpleader action or some other court action. Other than that, let's go into section five, short section. Section five, signs. We all want to sign in the front yard of our listing. Everybody wants a sign, at least most agents do. Sometimes sellers don't. So um, this section is really, really simple. I'll read it. It's short. Owner grants to broker the exclusive right to display for sale, under contract, sale pending, or other similar signs on the property and to remove other such signs. They're giving us permission to do so right then and there. Point that out. If your seller says they don't want any signs at all, you may need to have them remove that or get their attorney to remove that by scratching that out. But they're providing us permission right up front. Other than that, there's not a whole lot to that section. We're going to go on to section six. Section six talks about the broker's duties. And basically it says what the broker is, is going to do for the seller. I'll just read a little bit here. Broker agrees to employ the best efforts of broker and broker's agents and staff to secure a contract of sale for the de described property upon such terms as may be agreeable to the owner. That's a very broad statement. The listing brokerage is stating there that they're gonna do everything they possibly can to make sure that they bring the seller a contract so they can get the property sold. That's the reason for this agreement. It goes on to say a few other things to keep the, the seller uh, uh, informed of everything that's going on, um, that they're going to advertise the property uh, it, it, multiple advertising medias of merit customarily used in the area, um, furnishing such additional information such as necessary to cooperating real estate brokers, especially the MLS. I mean, it just basically goes into everything that we're going to do to bring about a contract of sale. And also at the last line there, brokers shall keep confidential all information received during the course of this agreement, which was made confidential by written request or instructions from the client, except as provided under South Carolina law. Basically, you owe the seller a duty for confidentiality. Please keep your confidentiality. That could be considered a violation of real estate law as well as a violation of the code of ethics. So do your best efforts to get the property sold. That is your duty as a listing agent, as well as your listing brokerages. Let's go on to section seven. Section seven, as you can see there, is in italics. And this is in our buyer's agency agreement as well. Um, and this 
I get a lot of questions on this section because it, 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 it tends to have some wording in there that would make possibly some sellers and or buyers uncomfortable. Um, and a lot of agents have a difficult time explaining this because of some of the wording in here. Not that it's wrong. Remember, SCR, South Carolina Association of Realtors, protects their members. LLR protects members of the public. So this is a protection clause for us. And instead of me reading it and getting you all confused, let me basically explain this, this, this section. Basically, it says everything that we're doing we're providing services, we're providing advice, we're providing benefits and assistance and, and, and value to the seller. But if you or the listing brokerage does something in error or unintentional that the seller is not in agreement, agreement with or may cause the seller a loss, this section states that if the seller decides to file a lawsuit that the seller would only be entitled to obtain that of which they would have paid you to get the property sold, basically the commission amount. If you do things that are not willful or intentional to cause the loss, if it's just an accident, they don't like it, they take it to court, by this contract, they're only, uh, it says that they're only able to get what their commission amount, what they would have paid you, not exceeding. The problem is, is that people have a tendency to read on in this because it says, as well as covering all of the fees and court costs for the agent. So that's where we run into a little bit of a problem that sellers may not like that. They said, it says that they're gonna cover your court fees and costs. It also says that the seller will hold harmless and indemnify parties that the listing brokerage or the listing agent has recommended. For example, home inspectors or professional service providers of some sort. If they do something and the seller goes after them, this document says that they're going to hold the agent harmless. You really need to know this section because this is a pretty important section. People want to know that they have some rights. So just read that, put it in, maybe highlight a few different words and let them see that. Now, if there's a problem with a seller with this area, uh, my recommendation is to have them contact a real estate attorney or another attorney, have the attorney explain this section as well. And if the attorney and them want to get together with how they want to change this, that is totally up to them and the attorney, and there will, needs to be an agreement between you or the listing broker, the listing brokerage, to find out whatever changes need to be made. I'm not recommending changing a contract whatsoever, uh, especially for agents to do that. That's the unauthorized practice of law. So have an attorney look that over if there's any problem with the seller at, in this section. It's my professional advice and opinion. Other than that, let's go into section eight. Section eight talks about the owner's duties. Now, if you're going to spend a lot of time here, uh, I, I in any other area of this contract, I would suggest you spending the most of your time here so sellers know exactly what you need their help with. Remember, selling a home between an agent and a listing brokerage is a partnership. It's a symbiotic relationship. Therefore, um, owners need to do something to help you and the listing brokerage get the property sold. So we're gonna go through a few of these. To furnish broker with complete and reliable information. Well, that's a given. We need to know everything we need to know about the property so that we can sell it with all proper information and to disclose anything that we need to disclose. We need to know that. To inform broker of any inquiries from other brokers or negotiations concerning the sale of the property, that's pretty simple. To permit inspection and showing of the property by broker, the broker's agents or sub-agents, buyer's agents, and by such agents, sub-agents, and prospective buyers as deemed reasonably necessary by a broker and to cooperate in the scheduling and carrying out of such showings and instructions as is necessary. Basically, to let people in to see the property, to help us show the property so we can get it sold for them. 
to permit offering for sale of the property to prospective buyers without regard to age, sex, race, creed, color, religion, national origin, handicap, or familial status. Uh, we don't deal with discrimination here at Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Cedar and Joyner Realtors. We need the sellers not to do that as well. That could be considered fair, a fair housing issue and could we could get the federal government involved. We don't want that to happen. We need to make sure there's non-discrimination totally across the board. Um, this section E, sometimes I get a lot of questions on this because there's a blank line there for a dollar amount. To permit broker to incur or pay on behalf of owner reasonable expenses for repairs, inspection, utilities, maintenance, or similar expenses not to exceed a dollar amount for each separate expense and to reimburse broker as necessary upon receipt of the statement of expenses. So here's a hypothetical. So if I'm listing a property or if you're listing a property um, and the the seller is out of town for several weeks in the summer and you know that the grass is growing in this section the seller can actually provide up to a certain dollar amount for you to make sure that the yard is being maintained and to pay the landscape uh, vendor for that and then the seller will reimburse you those expenses that's just a really quick quick way to explain that section e and it says to allow closing attorney to pay brokers compensation in an amount equal to the compensation provided above, remember the section that we were talking about in section three, from owner's proceeds at the time of closing. Uh, again, at the bottom of the page, you have some initials there for all the owners and for uh, the listing agent to initial. On page three, we go on uh, several more duties by the, by the, uh, for the seller, I should say to grant to broker the authority and approval to list and publish all sales data pertaining to the sale and closing of the uh, of the, of the here and above described property. Owner understands and acknowledges that sales data are published for the use of information for members of the of boards and associations. Basically, once this property sells, we're going to publish that so other agents can use that for their comparative market analysis and other stuff like that for sales data. So they're giving us permission to do that. Uh, H, to permit broker to take photographs um, and for advertising and marketing purposes and advertising mediums with those photographs. Let's see, it says owner understands and acknowledges that all marketing materials, including but not limited to photographs, brochures, and websites developed for the sale of the subject property shall remain the property of the broker. Just because you take pro photographs of a person's house, they, they are not uh, owned by the seller. I, to convey marketable title to buyer and fee simple free from all liens except those stipulated herein, subject to existing zoning and government restrictions applicable, owners association assessments and restrictive conditions and covenants of record, which do not materially affect the present use of the property, and J, to authorize owner's attorneys and the settlement agent to furnish to broker copies of the final settlement statement for the transaction prior to the closing date. It says K, not to deal directly with prospective buyers. That's huge. They need to refer to you, the sellers need to refer to you, any buyers that contact them, not to deal directly with prospective buyers of this property during the period of this agency, and shall refer, shall, not may, shall refer any inquiries received directly and immediately to the broker. Now, L. This is huge because this, this is also within your code of ethics. L, to authorize the broker in response to inquiries from buyers or cooperating brokers to divulge the existence of offers on the property. The code of ethics states you must provide that information if given permission by the seller. This listing agreement provides you permission to to give the existence of multiple offers on a property or the existence of other offers on a property. It does not give you permission to tell them the price of the offer. It says to give them permission to divulge the existence of offers on the property, just like your code of ethics says. So um, just make sure they understand that as well. To an M, last portion, to furnish broker with written instructions regarding the confidentiality of information upon termination or completion of this agreement, which was received during the course of this agreement in accordance with South Carolina law. 
if they specifically want you to maintain confidentiality on something specific that may not necessarily be confidential, they need to write that in instructions to you. Other than that, let's go into Section 9. Section 9 talks about the uh, seller's disclosure and the fact that the seller is going to provide one to you. Now, remember, there's some exemptions in there well, where listings will not have a seller's disclosure. But in general, and for the most part, all listings that we have, for the most part, unless it's a, an, a, uh, an estate sale or a foreclosure or a transfer from one family member to another, for the most part, you have seller's disclosures in our listings. So it talks about that the seller is going to fill that out in its entirety. It also says in the middle of the section there, I'm not going to read it. It's, it's fairly long. Read it, read it, read it, read this contract over and over, know it like the back of your hand. But it also says that the seller will hold the listing brokerage harmless and indemnify them in the fact that any problems arose out of the filing of this document or filling this document out. Remember, we cannot touch this document at all. We can't fill it out for them. We can be a scribe if they're, let's say, for lack of a better example, if they were blind, we can ask them questions and be a scribe to them, but we can't answer questions or fill this out on their behalf. Uh, let's go into section 10. Section 10 talks about disclosure, and there's a whole lot of disclosure that we can refer to here, uh, but basically it says that the, the seller is going to provide to the broker, the broker's agents, it says sub-agents and prospective buyers, they're buyer's agents, um, it, they're, they're going to disclose anything about the property that they know. It says such disclosure shall be in accordance with broker's company policy. And it says owner hereby authorizes anyone having a lien against the property. So it's not just disclosing the presence of a, prob a problem or a material fact. It says they're going to disclose the fact that they have a lien against the property, including the mortgage holder, to disclose complete information about the lien to broker and the closing attorney. So if they have a lien against property, it says they need to disclose it. So we know how to best advise them. And they need to disclose that to the the attorney so they can get the final payoff. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, pretty easy. Let's talk about Section 11 taxes. Section 11 is taxes, and um, this is a short section. I'm going to read the entire thing just because uh, there's some things in here that I really want to get, a, get across to you. Owner covenants and agrees to comply with the provisions of South Carolina Code Section 128580 as amended regarding withholding requirements of owners who are not residents of South Carolina as defined in the said statute. The payment of rollback taxes, if applicable, and past personal property taxes, if ap applicable, shall be negotiated between the owner and the prospective buyer. Remember in our contract for sale and our raw land contract for sale, there's a decision whether uh, who's going to pay rollback taxes. Um, and if it, you know, sometimes a person can't pay the personal property taxes and a buyer is willing to buy the property and pay any uh, property taxes that are, are owed on the property that the buyer takes that on. Now, that's not often, but that does happen. And if you, a, if you are representing a uh, seller that's from out of state, uh, there could be some, and more than likely, there's going to be some taxes withheld for selling a property when you're not a resident of South Carolina. Um, I wouldn't make any advice on that. I would have them speak to the closing attorney on that if they're a resident outside of South Carolina. Remember, we're not tax professionals. We're real estate agents. Stay in your lane. Don't make uh, professional tax advice. So that's the reason why I wanted to really kind of discuss that a little bit more. Let's go into Section 12. Section 12 doesn't really affect us here in Greenville, so to speak, because it's the Coastal Tidelands and Wetlands Act. This is more for the southern areas or the coastal areas of the state, but we'll talk about it in, in, in any case because other people are also watching this particular video, not just here in Greenville. 
It says, in the event the property is affected by the provisions of the South Carolina Coastal Tidelands and Wetlands Act, and it gives the section there, an addendum will be attached to the sales agreement incorporating the required disclosures. The payment of any necessary surveys shall be negotiated between the owner and other and any prospective buyer. So if the property is affected by it, there needs to be another amendment, a correction, addendum, and the other documents and disclosures that goes along with that. Again, it doesn't affect us here in Greenville, but other areas of the state, this does affect. So please make sure that you have those addendums and those disclosures uh, when, that time is, when that time comes. Let's go on to section 13. Section 13 talks about the multiple listing service, and this document actually gives us permission to list the property in our uh, multiple listing service. Now, it says, it shall or shall not be entered into the multiple listing services of which the broker is a member, which shall constitute an offer of cooperating brokers. Remember, the multiple listing service is cooperation with other brokerage and compensation to the person or agent or listing company that brings the buyer. It's a compensation agreement. To all members of the listing service, owner agrees that broker may compensate any agent representing the buyer from the fees described above. Remember, we already talked about that. Now, there is, it's a shall or shall not. For the purposes of this video, I'm not going to go into the shall not. Um, it's most of the time, it shall be. Now, the shall not, is when you get into an MLS exempt listings. That's a totally different training that I'll probably do on a video. And you will absolutely need to check with your broker, uh, especially due to the near the, the uh, clear cooperation policy that was just put into effect by the National Association of Realtors and all uh, other, uh, basically all other uh, MLSs across the country for clear cooperation. Um, when you do an MLS exempt uh, listing. So I'm not going to get into that on this section. Uh, I'll get into that on another video. Other than that, if you need to, if somebody does not want to do a listing in, in the MLS, if you don't know how to handle that, check with your broker. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that in this section. Let's go on to section 14. Section 14 talks about lockboxes and whether or not the seller will allow uh, you as the listing broker or agent or brokerage to put a lockbox on their property. Uh, most of the time, this is not even an issue. You get a lockbox, it's secure, people are okay with that. They realize that only realtors, for the most part, have a lockbox and there's other security measures if you're not a realtor uh, that you can't just walk up to a lockbox and get the key. They understand that. But I want to bring up something to your attention. It says, owner acknowledges and agrees that neither broker nor broker's agents, subagents, or anyone showing the property through the MLS shall be responsible for any damage to or loss of personal property or to the realty except such damage or loss may be caused by the negligence of such party, by the negligence of the person showing. Okay. It says on page four, top of page four, owner further acknowledges that broker nor MLS is an insurer against the loss of personal property and agrees to release broker and MLS from any responsibility therefore. So there's always going to be uh, some protection in there and for some liability when people are being given to access to somebody's house. And so they just need to know, the seller needs to know, we're not an insurer. Uh, if, if, if there's a no fault to the party, um, we're not responsible for that. So if there's damage that are caused uh, for an accident, by the way, we're not responsible for that. So hopefully you understand that. Hopefully the seller understands that. Again, not hard to understand, but just I wanted to bring that to your attention. Let's go on to section 15. Section 15 talks about internet marketing and whether the owner agrees or does not agree that the listing may be placed in electronic marketing mediums, including but not limited to the internet, the multiple listing service internet data exchange, so it goes on other uh, brokerages um, websites, or other similar online computer services and to sharing the listing data, including the property address, with other members of the MLS for marketing and advertising purposes only. 
owner further agrees to permit other real estate firms who belong to any listing service of which broker is a member to advertise the listing on the internet in accordance with the listing service rules and regulations. Now let me say this. There are areas when you place this property on MLS that you can uncheck internet data exchange and it going to other brokerages um, and to go on other websites. There's areas in the MLS that can do that where it will only keep it on the MLS. Make sure that the owner understands if they don't want it out there that you're going to have to do that. Um, but that's going to limit the exposure of the property and that may not be the very best thing for the seller to do. So there are other ways around if somebody does not want or a seller does not want their property really out there on the internet or being uh, shown on other brokerages websites or shown on realtor.com or zillow.com. Speak with your broker about that. Uh, for the most part, we don't really see does not agree. We see almost all sellers providing that information, knowing or giving us permission to do that, knowing that these main websites, Zillow, Trulia, the other ones out there, other listing brokerages, even in the MLS, that's a, a high percentage of what gets property sold nowadays. So again, not a whole lot there. Let's go on to section 16. Section 16 talks about other offers and it says the owner understands that the broker's responsibility to present offers to purchase to the owner for owner's consideration terminates at closing. Well, that's a given. Why would we present an offer on a property that's already closed of the subject property or expiration of this agreement, whichever occurs first? I mean, that's pretty well simple. Um, now, in South Carolina, remember, even if that property goes under contract, we have to present all offers. All offers, even if the property is under contract. But this contract allows us, if the property is closed and somebody wants to offer on the property, uh, that terminates at closing or the expiration of this agreement. We do not have to uh, present an offer after the expiration of this agreement. Not a whole lot there. Let's go on to section 17. Section 17 is a very short section. It's called marketing the property. The broker shall not continue to market the property after an offer has been accepted unless requested in writing by the owner to do so. Now this, this document says that we don't have to do that. We don't have to con continue to market it. Um, I'm of the belief that a property basically should be marketed, should have a sign and everything else until the property is closed. Now, we obviously are not gonna say that it's active when it's under contingent or pending contract. That would be an ethical violation. However, we continue to market the property and we keep marketing materials on it and we answer questions about it um, because anything could happen between contract and close. So your brokerage may be different. Um, I'm of the belief that we should continue to market properties even after contract. Check with your broker on that, whatever they want to do, however they want to do it. Let's go on to section 18. Section 18 talks about the fact that there's no control of commission rates or fees. Basically, our company charges a certain dollar amount and the policy allows our agents to drop to a certain amount without broker permission. And then if you drop below a certain amount, you will need another certain amount, you will need broker permission to do so. That's our basic policy. Now, we have no idea what other brokerages charge. We, we have no control over what they charge. What we charge is what we charge. And brokerages can't get together to, to control that commission rate. Um, it's not a fixed thing across the board. If they, if they interview five other brokerages, the, they can get five different listing rates or fees. So you need to make sure that the seller knows that we don't know what another listing brokerage would charge. If they say they got another charge because they interviewed that person before you, that's fine. What we charge is what in, is in our policy and we don't get together with other brokerages to fix commissions that is against federal law and antitrust. There's really not a whole lot to say there. So let's move on to section 19 maintenance. Section 19 talks about maintenance and what the seller needs to maintain from the listing agreement to the time of closing or possession. So we'll read it. It's not a whole lot. 
to it, not, not hard to understand. Owner agrees to maintain the property, including lawn, shrubbery, and grounds until the day of closing or possession, whichever occurs first. Owner also warrants that all heating, air conditioning, electrical, and plumbing systems, as well as built-in pertinent equipment or appliances, shall be in operative condition on the day of closing or possession, again, whichever occurs first. Unless otherwise agreed herein, owner shall deliver the premises to the buyer with no broken panes, no torn or missing door screens or window screens, and with no missing or broken hardware, lighting, or plumbing fixtures. Not a whole lot there. Let's move on to section 20, the agreement to sell. Section 20, the agreement to sell. When a buyer is found for said property, the owner shall enter a written sales agreement, which will contain the terms and conditions of sale, the customary provisions as to the examination of the title, the cur curing of any defects in title, the proration of taxes, rents, and applicable property expenses. Basically, a line to say, uh, we're going to list your property, and then we're going to get you into a contract for sale with a buyer that will explain all the terms of how the, the passing of your property is going to go to the next buyer. So not a whole lot there. They just got to understand that a contract uh, hopefully is imminent and will be coming because that's the way a, a property is transferred when we list it. 21 lead-based paint. Not a whole lot to discuss here. If the property was built prior to 1978, all listings need to have the federal lead-based paint document signed by all parties and the agents. So just prepare uh, your seller, if they have a property built prior to 1978, that a lead-based paint is going to need to be filed. Now, most of the time, <clears throat> most of the time, sellers do not know whether there's lead-based paint in the property. If they do, and they have records of that, that document will uh, have check marks to say the seller has knowledge, the seller has documents, all the above. Uh, most of the time, we don't see that the seller has any knowledge of that. Just you know, make sure you, you let your sellers know they need to fill this document out if the property is built before 1978. Pretty well self-explanatory there. Let's go on to section 22. Section 22, mediation clause. Basically, even before I go into reading it, basically what this clause allows is that if there's a problem that arises between the seller and the listing agent or the listing brokerage, that the National Association of Realtors has set up mediation uh, across the country, and especially here in Greenville, uh, we have our own mediators and what they call ombudsmen to mediate certain circumstances that don't necessarily rise to the occasion of going to actual physical court. Um, that the seller and the agent or the listing brokerage can get together with mediators to determine, uh, you know, what happened, how can, how can we keep from going to court to mediate between the parties. So there is actions and, uh, and, 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 and currences for that with our local association. So they need to know that they do have some rights and that the National Association of Realtors has, has put into place this particular program to keep people from having to spend you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars of going to court. These things can be taken care of. The, the, the one section in there, it says, uh, disputes shall include representations made by owner or broker in connection with the services to which this agreement pertains, including without limitation allegations of concealment, misrepresentation, negligence, and or fraud any agreement signed by the parties pursuant to the mediation conference shall be binding. This mediation clause shall, shall survive for a period of 120 days after the date of closing. So there is a time frame there. Just make sure that everybody understands that. But it is also binding once it's um, completed by the mediators. It's a pretty short, short section as well. It says, owner and broker agree that the property is offered without regard to race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, or national origin, and is listed in full compliance with local, state, and federal fair housing laws. So uh, we avoid the very mere essence of discrimination uh, when, we, when we sell uh, property and when we bring buyers to property. So uh, please let your sellers know no discrimination whatsoever. So hopefully that explains that. Let's go into section 24. 
Section 24, facsimile, says the parties agree that this agreement may be communicated by use of a fax or other secure electronic means, including but not limited to the internet and the signatures, initials, and hand handwritten or typewritten modifications to any of the foregoing shall be deemed to be valid and binding upon the parties as if they were original signatures, for example, signed in blue ink, original, not copied. Initials and handwritten or typewritten modifications were present on the documents and the handwriting of each party. So if it's done digitally, if it's done through fax, done through email, it's the same exact thing as if it was an originally signed document. That's pretty standard here in 2020. Don't think we need to go on any, any further information on that. Let's go to section 25, enforcement. So section 25, so the parties agree that brokers may take action to enforce this agreement or collect any associated costs, fees, and damages. Owner agrees to reimburse or indemnify or pay all brokers cost in enforcing this agreement or collecting cost, fees, and damages, including any incidental expenses or attorney's fees. So again, this document is meant to dissuade sellers from just uh, merely suing and trying to collect uh, fees from the listing agent or the listing brokerage. They, if there's a problem, they want you to go to mediation, keep everything out of court, but this is an enforceable document. Therefore, it's enforceable by the seller toward the listing company or listing brokerage or listing agent. And it's also enforceable by the listing brokerage to go after the seller if they found out that the seller did something wrong. So this is a legal and binding contract. Section 26 talks about the sex offender and criminal information. Um, I'm going to read this, but I'm also going to make some very uh, specific statements. It says, seller agrees that broker is not responsible for obtaining or disclosing information in the South Carolina sex offender registry, and no course of action may be brought against the broker for failure to obtain or disclose sex offender or criminal information. Seller agrees that they have the sole responsibility to obtain their own sex offender, death, psychological stigma, clandestine laboratory, and crime information from sources, for example, law enforcement, uh, private investigators, the internet, the web. The seller may obtain information about the sex offender registry and per persons registered within the registry by contacting the local county sheriff or other appropriate, appropriate law enforcement officials. Here's what I wanna say all about that, okay? Um, it says it's not your responsibility for obtaining or disclosing. Um, I, if that, if this conversation even comes up, simply say I refer you to the local sheriff's office for anything regarding this. We don't want to get ourselves involved in some lawsuit stating that somebody is or somebody was or somebody's living in some neighborhood that could be on there. That is just something we don't even want to go. Uh, toward and steer clear away from that information. Let your presence be known and let your opinion be known. If this is important to them, contact their local law enforcement or sheriff's association to gather that information. Section 27 is a new section of this particular uh, listing agreement or form 220. It wasn't in the contract before uh, before January 2020. So let's definitely read this so we understand this. Section 27, photography. Seller irrevocably conveys any and all of the seller's audio, photography, and video rights in perpetuity, or in other words, forever, involving seller and seller's family and seller's property to broker for marketing and advertising and any other purpose deemed necessary by the broker. So basically the way I understand this is when a photographer goes in there and there are other photos within the property um, that if, if the seller wants to leave those photos up in the property and your photographer and those photos are taken and a picture is taken of another picture, they can't come back to us and say that there's a violation of copyright. Um, that's what this is trying to protect. They're conveying that those rights to us for taking photos for anything that's taken within their within their property. So hopefully that explains that. If not, 
I would highly encourage you to contact the legal department of the South Carolina Association of Realtors for further information on that. Because again, this is still so new. We, I've not even experienced anything re involving this. So if you have more questions about this, I would defer you to the South Carolina Association of Realtors legal department and legal hotline. Section 28, surveillance. This is pretty important considering everybody has a camera now. It says, seller agrees to abide by any laws and regulations regulating audio and video surveillance of the property and persons entering the property, including agreeing not to use any surveillance in areas where persons have an expectation of privacy, such as restrooms. Seller agrees that the broker may or may not disclose potential surveillances or surveillance as broker deems necessary, included, including signage on the property and advertising uh, or in any advertising and marketing. Okay, so we're teaching our agents just automatically assume that there is surveillance and or recording audio equipment and video equipment in every house and to hold all the discussions and um, statements until you're off premises of the property. That's specific in the buyer's agency agreement. Um, but this is giving uh, the agent the authority to disclose it or not to disclose it. And I'm, 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 I'm in hopes that most sellers will say, yes, you have the authority to, to say that I have surveillance equipment in my house, but there could be some that say they don't. And so you either check may or may not disclose it. Um, I would highly encourage you if they do give you that permission that you do obviously put that in the member remarks of your MLS. Um, so everybody's aware there is surveillance in the, in the property and so that there's not a problem that arises when a property is being shown. Again, let me stop and say, if you have an issue with something that I've said in this particular section, this is also a newer section, please, I implore you, contact the South Carolina Association of Realtors legal hotline and let them also explain this to you as well. Section 29 is very simple. It says other terms and condition, and it's got some lines in there. Um, I guess that's going to be between the seller and the listing brokerage. What are the types of conditions? Um, I, I mean, I can think of one right off the bat. If, this, if uh, you, as the listing agent and the seller, agree to maybe uh, certain price reductions along the way, um, this may be a, a decent area to put that in. For example, if the listing price is set at one thing at listing date, and um, you and your seller decide that if the property is not under contract within a certain period of time, that the listing price shall be reduced to a certain amount and the MLS will be updated on that certain date that you choose. Uh, that's a section that I would probably use for that. Uh, I'm sure that you can probably think of other conditions or other terms that you may want to put in that section as well. Um, but there it is for you to fill it out and agree to. So we will go on to the bold writing right underneath that section. Okay, so this section is not really numbered. So this is we're referring to the bold, um, all in capital letters right below section 29. And I'm gonna read it because anytime something is bold and in all caps, it's probably pretty important. So it says the undersigned hereby warrant that they own the property, I hope so, and or have the authority to execute this agreement. And I hope so for that too. This is a legally binding agreement. Owners shall seek further assistance if the contents are not understood. Let me stop right there. They shall seek further assistance. If there's a problem with a seller not understanding or questioning something in this agreement, we need to refer them to legal, uh, to an attorney, somebody else with legal authority to explain this document to them. We are not attorneys. We cannot uh, practice law. And if there's a problem regarding this particular legal and binding agreement, they need to seek legal counsel if they don't understand or they're not explaining it to the point where they understand it. If they don't agree with something, if they don't want to sign something, it'd be a good idea for you also to have them contact an attorney as well. I'll continue on. Owner acknowledges receipt of a copy of this agreement. Okay, so when they sign it, you gotta give them a copy and a copy of the South Carolina Disclosure of Real Estate Brokerage Relationships uh, form. Again, they've already signed for that or initialed for that on page one. 
But if they're again, they're acknowledging it, receiving it, and if you've given them a meaningful explanation of what that form says. It also says owner agrees to receive communications from the broker at the email address, phone, and fax number listed below. And that's where the owner is going to sign, date, and time. Uh, provide the email address, especially, you know, given the fact that something happened to you, the broker in charge needs to know exactly how to get a hold of its listing clients. Other than that, you go on and continue to fill the rest of that out and the, the real estate firm there, you sign the document, uh, you date and time. And remember on the bottom of this page too, there's also owner initials and broker initials on the bottom of page five. That will conclude the training on Form 220, the exclusive right to sell. Let me end as always with my disclaimer. So as I mentioned at the very beginning of this video, I am not an attorney. I am simply a broker in charge, uh, putting out this video to help the agents of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Seed and Joiner Realtors, uh, how, have them get their questions answered about what something means or how to explain something in this section or in this document completely. Uh, and it's also for the use of other agents across the state of South Carolina that are licensed under in real estate under South Carolina law. Um, again, I am errant. I'm not God. If I've made a mistake, please kindly let me know. I will correct it. But I want to stop and say this. If you do not work as an associated licensee underneath my license and you feel that I've said something that you may disagree with or that you know that your broker disagrees with, please, I implore you, go with what your broker in charge says. Please just contact them. If I've not explained something appropriately, please go back to them and have your broker explain it. I'm always going to push everybody back to their broker in charge. Uh, again, the way I interpret something may not be exactly the way your broker in charge interprets something. So check with them and make sure that they're good with everything that may have been taught in this video. And if they're not, go by what they say. And I implore you as well, I've said it a couple times, if you think I've said something wrong, or if there's a problem with something that I've said, please contact the legal department or the legal hotline of the South Carolina Association of Realtors and get their interpretation and their take. I uh, This video is not in any way, shape, or form endorsed or or even uh, uh, any, any way by the South Carolina Association of Realtors um, that's had me do this. They have not. Okay, uh, this is again a training for our particular company. So I just want to let you know that right up front, SCR has nothing to do with this video, um, but they are a great resource to get your questions answered if this video has not. I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope to see you around the real estate corner. I hope to do business with you soon. Take care. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye now.